Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Brother Hugh Jones. Uh, He's Seneca, and he lives out east from us here in the west. Um, I I talked to him a while ago, a couple months ago, and I just was so excited to have this interview with him because he... In that, in that pre-interview, in that chat that we had before, he just had so much good to share even then, and I was looking forward to this time with him for us today. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy for that. There's a little bit of noise in the background today, I'll just let you know that right now, but you, he talks clearly and loudly, so there's no problem with that, but um, I, I, I don't know, I... I don't always ask about the um, spiritual well-being of of a person's children because they're their own individuals as well, of course. But I am glad that I asked today because uh, Brother Jones has some really great advice and I could really feel the Holy Ghost in his his answer. So I I hope you look forward to that. Um, It's such a good interview and I'm so grateful for him. Here's Brother jo- brother Hugh Jones. I'm on the phone today with Brother Hugh Jones. Um, we are across the continent from each other and we've never met and maybe someday we can and whatever, maybe we can't. But... Um, Yeah, so, Brother Jones, Hugh, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Yes, I, uh, yeah, I get that. I'm, uh, my name is Hugh Jones. Um, In our traditional way, we, we uh, greet each other with a Nyawe Skeno. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's uh, in the English language you're translating it. It, it means I'm um, I'm glad that you are well, or I'm thankful that you are well. And uh, so we we that's kind of what we do. But I'm and there's more to our greetings and stuff like that. But I'm not really overly fluent in the language like some might be. And so I um so I, I I'm a little bit handicapped that way when it comes to the language. And which tribe? I'm in the I I'm a member of the Seneca. Nation of the uh, Wolf Clan, and so we would say that in our we were, were going to introduce ourselves. We would say that, and we would tell them that we are of the Wolf Clan, and that's in the English language, so you can understand that. That we would just say, "Yes, I'm Seneca," and I do know the word for Seneca, which is Onondaga. So it's we are the Seneca people, and it's uh, the translation of Onondaga is the people of the Great Mountain or the great people of the Great Hill. And so that's what how that translates over. So I know a little bit about language, but I don't know. I just know enough to be dangerous, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, that's my name, and I uh, of the Wolf Clan, Seneca Nation. I grew up in uh, the Cattaraugus Territory of uh, Western New York. And uh, I've spent some years, I, I immigrated to Utah and lived there for 12 years of my life. And then I moved my family here to Western New York and we've pretty much been here ever since. So well, a lot of my children were born in the West and two of my, of my six children were uh, born here in Western New York. Hugh, would you please share something that you love about your heritage? It could be a story, a celebration, a way of life, or a ceremony, or pretty much anything. Share something that you love about your heritage, but especially as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Well, two things. And actually, I, I hope you'll take, let me take a little liberty to do two, and even though you only asked for one. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really, it really pains me at times because of the lack of education and the lack of and the importance of some of the history that parallels, like American history parallels with Haudenosaunee which Haudenosaunee people are the, uh, or what they would call in English, they call them the Iroquois. And the Iroquois is the, the five and the six nations uh, here in Western, the five tribes, the six tribes that have come together to form a great peace, they call it. And so the, I just, it really, it took 200 years, you know, to, to, it took 200 years to recognize the contributions of the Haudenosaunee uh, to the American Constitution, because the founding fathers were actually meeting with leaders of the Iroquois nations in order to form the American Constitution. But that somehow gets left out of the um, of the American con or of the, the history books in a lot of ways. But it's in there. It just doesn't get emphasized. And so it's kind of a shame, but I'd like to say something about that. I just like I'm really excited how the Haudenosaunee Constitution and the American Constitution are so like, they're like brothers. They really are bro brothers. So if you just look at their both their government situations and their how they used to run things, it's really, it's, it was really great. So it's a very ingenious document. And I just think that the, it's a, a great credit to some of our early leaders here of the Haudenosaunee. They really were um, good folks that were trying to have good governance and and raise good families and so forth. And so they were they really were a, a good folk, a good people. And then the uh, of course the American government is I I think that they're even though we are having struggles with their constitution in today's world, I think the core of it is still well remembered by the American people. And so I think uh, it will survive eventually. And uh, the other one was how the other that I'm gonna share with you is um, more in lines of a more spiritual, a spiritual note. And that is um, the concept of being engaged in a good cause without having to be commanded. And uh, this was well known. My grandfather was not a member of the church, but he, he understood this concept. And uh, one of my aunts went to George Washington University and stayed with a relative down there. My grandfather went to visit his daughter, who is my aunt, and uh, he went down to you know, Washington, D.C. area and took a train in those days. That's how you did it. And he stayed with them for, you know, a week, whatever it was, a little, a little to visit his daughter while she was at George Washington University. And he noticed this list that the relative would leave for my aunt as uh, house chores. and. He, in the language, in the Seneca language, he scolded uh, the relative. He scolded our relative. And they were speaking back and forth very seriously in the Seneca language because they both spoke the language very fluently. And when it was done, my aunt asked, because she didn't understand that she was by this time there, that generation was going you know, to be getting where the English was the dominant language. She asked her father, she, or asked, she asked the relative after her father went back to New York. And she says, what, what did you guys discuss? It sounded pretty serious. And she says, yes, your dad, she says, your dad was scolding me. He says, my aunt says, why, why were you being scolded? She says, well, you know, you see these lists that I leave for you to do chores around the home here? And he, he said, he said he was scolding me because of that. And he says, well, why? He says, why would you do that? He says, well, I says, your father told me 
in the language. It says, I trained that girl to do things without having to be told. And here you are training her to, to the exact opposite. And I thought that was really a great, that's a great lesson for all of us to, to do what's good and what's right without having to be told, without having to be watched over every second of the way. And in fact, there's a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that kind of de deals with that very subject, that we should be engaged in a good cause without having to be told and commanded in all things. And so I thought that was, even though he had never really, my grandfather had never really accepted the restored gospel, that he understood that concept before, even though he had no light from the restored gospels, revelations and so forth. And so it was really neat. That's just a neat story for me to, to know about my grandfather. And so I, you know, I really kind of cherish that, that the heritage that he left behind in that. And so I've, I've strived all my days to, to do things without having to be told. But I'm not perfect at it, but I, I do strive for it on a regular basis. So it's uh, something that I think we can all learn from. I love both of the things that you just shared. First of all, this episode is going up on the 4th of July week. And I really appreciate you sharing about how um, you cherish the the Constitution in a, in a different way, just from not just from the fact that the Constitution is an inspired document, but because it it is part of your heritage. I love that so much. It makes me feel grateful to you and to your, to your people, to their, um, to their diligence in setting up a good government themselves. I love that. And I love that story you just told about your grandpa. I, that is, I, that's food for thought for me as a parent. I, I need to, to uh, train my children to be more aware of of uh, doing good themselves without being told. I love that. That was uh, that was his message, and I, you know, I never even met my grandfather. He, I was born in '65, and he died in '62. So I, as a mortal, I've never met him before, and so. It was great to hear stories about about him and how he dealt. Now he was, you know, there's a lot of people in my family who go, oh, he was a, he did this wrong and did that wrong. And everybody, that's not about what we're doing. I don't think what we're doing here in this setting. I think we're trying to find ways to honor our heritage and honor the people that were a part of that heritage. And that, so that's what I, I, I'm striving for here in this situation is to, is to bring honor to my, to my, not only to my parents, but grandparents and, and, uh, you know, great grandparents and beyond. And so I think that that's, you know, that's all fitting and it should be, it should be done on a regular basis by a lot of people. I think we'd have less of the ills that are, that affect our communities today. Uh, if we were to honor our mothers and fathers and so forth. So I think that that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. Um, so earlier when we were just visiting, you were talking about um, how you've been doing some family history, some family research, and and it has um, affected you in a good way. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, there's in my family history, oh, you'll, you'll all know my last name is Joan, and that's not by because we adopted the name from the English. That's because we are literally uh, British British Isles. You know, the name does come and we, you know, in our family history, we've basically been able to trace those lines to the British Isles and to Wales and other places. I've got a lot of Irish on my mother's side and some German on my dad's side. And so uh, there's a lot of this, you know, there, there was a lot of this mixture that happened in the, my fourth great grandfather uh, 
was captured by Senecas back in the colonial times. And uh, during the, it was actually pre-Revolutionary uh, War. And uh, he, he helped with a lot of the negotiations with the Seneca tribe and he, um, he spoke the language fluently on both ends of it, the, the English and the Seneca. And so as I got to learn more about this, this heritage, it made me feel differently about the relationships that were developed back in early days. And so I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm apt now to honor those, honor those relationships. Um, even though, you know, there was some bad things that happened and, and all of that, you know what I mean? But there was also some good things that came from it. And I think that that's really what the message of, the, of Jesus Christ is, is it not? It's the message of redemption and being able to, shall I say, receive forgiveness and, and, and be forgiven and all of these things that are like really really important aspects of the gospel of jesus christ and so you know i i learned about this guy just you know this guy in my family history my my the very same aunt that i just told you the uh, the story about she was on a family history mission back in you know the mid 90s uh shortly before she passed away and uh she told me, she says, you know, I think we're related to a guy named Horatio Jones. I haven't been able to prove it yet, she said. And so I'm just leaving that with you so that you can finish the research. And well, as we did begin to research it, we did make the connection with this Horatio Jones. And he is quite a high profile guy on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the races. And so he, you know, he brought a lot of honor to, to his, his parents and he brought a lot of honor to his Seneca heritage and so forth. And um, even though he was captured, he was actually recognized as a Seneca among the people. He had gained that kind of respect among them. And so for me, I used to think that, that my Israelite heritage <laughs> was only on one side. But now with more research going forward, I'm finding that many of the uh, British Isles actually had, had uh, ties to the, to the Holy Land. And so much of the heritage of the people of the British Isles before they came to America came from, came from the Middle East. And so you'll you'll find that as you research stuff like this, I'm finding that I have Israel on both sides, even though one comes through the Gentiles and the other one comes through the, the lines of Joseph, who was sold into Egypt. And so I, it's really interesting as you really start studying this stuff. I've gone, I've really, de I've delved pretty deep, deeply into some of this research, and it's really exciting news. It's exciting stuff. And so I really, I really enjoy uh, sharing it with whoever will even listen to it about. So I'm like, I'm excited to even, to, you know, share it with you. I have heritage, I have Israelite heritage, not only through my native lines, but through my Gentile lines through the British Isles. And so it's, and my patriarchal blessing, I'm an Ephraim, I'm the house of Ephraim even though most Native Americans are house of Manasseh. And so then I have a whole family. So I have four sons that are Manasseh and I have four brothers that are Manasseh. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's all around me. My mother is both in her patriarchal blessing. She's both Manasseh and Ephraim. And so, I mean, it's just a, it's a great heritage to have been from it. And I think that that reason she's both is because she has that, she has the blood from both lines. And she was able to pass both of those lines down to her sons. And 
and then of course me being able to pass that down to my sons as well so my sons and my daughter excuse me and so it's really interesting interesting stuff how we when we make this connection with israel and the book of mormon is such a testifier of all of this and if you haven't had a a deep dive and spiritual experience with the book of mormon i admonish anyone listening to this you have to read and pray and ask the spirit to help you understand the book of mormon in a spiritual way because it will change your life absolutely change your life and how you look look upon the different races and the different heritages and the different things that are going on in this life it just makes in it it turns us into brothers and sisters and all as part of the family of god and that's really what we're really about that's what there was to me the restored gospel its whole mission is built around that very concept to teach people that they're children of god and they're children of god first and then their heritages come second and so that's for me that's how that works out to be an exciting exciting news of the restored gospel i love that so you said that your grandfather never did accept the restored gospel as we know it on this side right. how on did, this side of the veil. yeah yes. how did your family um come to have the gospel and why do you choose to have you have you had uh, times when you've had to consciously choose to stay with the gospel as we know it. Absolutely, almost on a daily basis. Uh, my grandfather actually was the first, he was the one to, he accepted the missionaries into the home. And my grandmother's the one that ended up joining the church, and he didn't. And he just never could get by that Joseph was a prophet. He never could get that. He never could get that. And so I think it was probably a good thing because it would it may have taken him more time. And so now I I kind of I have had some experiences in my life now where I I believe that he's he has accepted that now. But at the time when he was immortal, he just couldn't. It was real tough for him to except Joseph as a as the prophet of the restoration. And so and that's you know people struggle with that all the time. I think it's not uncommon for people to struggle with that, but I'm not sure that he ever read the Book of Mormon though. Nobody ever says that he did. And my my father says he was a Bible reading man and he had read the Bible lots. But I don't know if he ever had that experience with the Book of Mormon. Because the Book of Mormon connects the whole world into Christianity in my in my worldview of this. It connects the whole world with Jesus Christ. And I believe there's going to be more. There's going to be more revelatory type things that are going to happen. And more scripture is going to come forward. And we're going to, it's just going to confirm the truth of the, of the former scriptures. And so I think you're going to see it's going to be wonderful stuff when we, when we can finally have more of that type of scripture and that stuff come, come forward. It's just, and it's, it, if you just look at the, the span or the influence of the restored gospel, it's just an exciting thing. It's really built around uniting the family of God, because I believe God to be a family man. And that's what we're all about. We're all trying to be family people, are we not? Oh, yes. And so it's, you know, we have a lot of imperfections that are going to get in the way. Throughout, you know, I mean, there's going to be families that are broken. There's going to be families that are, you know, just having trial after trial and so forth. It's, and it's going to be tough as we journey here on, on the earth. But uh, in the end of it all, I believe the message is very clear that God is a family man. And he wants us to join his family. And I think we should all accept that invitation. Accept that invitation to join the family of God. And 
I hope that people are listening to this can feel the spirit of that, that they need to join the family of God. That's really what, what we're trying to do. You said you have four sons and a daughter? Five. Five sons and a daughter? Yes. And um, <clears throat> have you had any of them serve missions? I have four out of the six have served missions. Yes. I had uh, my oldest served a service mission with his handicap in Palmyra, uh, New York. And that was a really good mission for him. He did a great, great job. And I was really glad that some uh, my oldest son has autism. And so he was able to serve a, a service mission. My second oldest went to Brazil. My third, my daughter, went to Portland, Oregon. And my fourth son, Phil, went to uh, the California area. Um, I don't remember. One of his areas was the South Thousand Oaks area of California. And so, yeah, he was. And they all came back and have really had extremely good experiences with their, with their service time in that. And I, it's a pretty... My fifth son is a good boy. He's a really good, good man. I enjoy, enjoy him. He hasn't responded to the restored gospel like I would hoped, but we haven't. We, we all are in a different journey, you know. And so, I'm, I'm accepting that his journey may not be quite in that, you know, in that way, and that his journey is going to be maybe a slight bit different. And so I, I'm very hopeful that it will, at some point he will be able to accept the restored gospel in a more full way. And my youngest, he, he also did not, has not responded to, you know, missionary service. But again, I, I, I kudos to both of these young men. They're hard workers. They, you know, they have professions that they're pursuing on their own right now and doing good, doing good in both. Both are doing good in their, you know, chosen pr pursuits. And so there, I I give a lot of kudos to the those two boys. And so, as a word of advice, how have you been able to teach your your children as they grew up to be able to um, find answers to the hard questions that they might have that they might have? How uh, interesting you you mentioned that. Um, one of my son that went to Brazil called me up and said, you know, he had some pretty hard, hard questions for some of the things that are going on uh, with the history of the church, especially. Uh, some of them built around race issues and some of them are built around, you know, the plural marriage issues. And uh, he, you know, I've, I've been working with him He's like, it was, it really hurt him to find out some of the details of some of the early history of the church. Um, but at the same time, he is where he's working through it and I'm helping him. I'm coaching him. So parents, if there's any word of advice, you have got to get as a parent, you have to know the history of this church and you have to take a pretty deep dive because we are in a war and in a battle right now and we gotta we gotta help our children see the value of the restored gospel even though some of the history people are trying to tear it down because of its history and so we need to get in the fight we used to be able to like, you know, anti-Mormon things used to come across our our airwaves and in our literatures and so sort of, we used to be able to just ignore it and just move forward. Well, we, we can't ignore it anymore. It's, the, it, the internet has made it right front and center and right up in our face. And so I, my advice to any parents that are having struggles with children who are not responding to the restored gospel is, you got to get yourself 
to where you understand the history so you can explain it to your children. And it's, it's not easy. You have to take a pretty deep dive. And then even yourself, you have to find your peace with it. And there's a, there's a lot in there that people don't realize that you have to, you have to work through. But I think we, um, one, the other thing maybe that I'll add to that, to that recipe is that the modern prophets, and I don't, it doesn't matter, prophets of any age all made mistakes. Some of them were even duped. Some of them were even deceived. Okay. Um, Isaac got, re got deceived by Jacob to take birthright. Okay. <laughs> and he gave the birthright because he was blind. And he gave the birthright to, and, and, and you know, I, frankly, Jacob kind of, kind of didn't tell the truth in all. Okay. And so, you know, that history, that, that history is throughout all of the scriptures. It ain't just church history that has a bad history. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to look into the scriptures and go, you know, there really was a bad history in other eras, in other, in other dispensations, in other times. And so, and, you know, in fact, the reason that Jacob fooled him you know that's that's pretty much the reason why we have all this disagreement with the the Arabian nations and Israel today, even today that they're still fighting that disagreement today. And so, with that being said, we have to come to that understanding in a deeper way so we can we can love these kids back to where they belong. And if you're you're one of those that have had children that are struggling you know that's what we got to do we got to hold on to them with our faith and continue to just to love but we also got to have those explanations we've got to help them through the hard history of this and so you've got to know it if you don't know the history and if you, all you're doing is putting your head in the sand as an ostrich and just saying you know well, we're just going to move forward and just you know and ignore all the the barking in the back background. Well, the barking's in front of us now. We can't ignore it anymore. And if you don't have, Heber C. Kimball made a comment, made a, a general conference talk where he, he states that no man will one, it's one day no man will, will be no man alive that will be able to endure to the end on borrowed light. In a more recent general conference talk, they quoted that very quote from Heber C. Kimball, and then they added, the day is here when no man will be able to endure on borrowed light. So, yeah, you know, we, 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 each of us have got to get our own light, and we got to help our kids get that light. And it can't come because we're watching them. Has to be. It has to come because they feel motivated to it on their own. In other words, being engaged in a good cause. The kids need to be engaged in a good cause of their own free will, not because we're watching them or telling them to do it or, you know, what I mean, because that'll help them get that light. It'll help. It'll help train them, and how to be, how to listen to the Holy Ghost. And so it's really important that we we do that kind of thing. And we've just been spoon fed by the church and others. And I think that's what Come Follow Me is all about. They're trying to train us now to get our own light, to to find our own light, and to become involved in the scriptures and in prayer and all the really important aspects of what's going on in today's world. And I just I just think that that's any advice that can be given. I think that that is it. Help the kids get their own light and know your own history. We have to do it. We have to know this history. We can't ignore it any longer. So I think that's important. So. I I agree with you on all of that. I I definitely think 
that that's part of the reason why we do have come follow me. And, and I've noticed, um, in the past few years in the scriptures that, um, in the book of Mormon, Nephi went and got his own testimony of his dad's dream. He didn't just take it for himself. He's like, that's right. He's like, I want to know this as myself. And I think that's a great example for us as whatever age we are. We need right. to do it for ourselves. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And we have to, before we can be an effective light to others, we have to have it ourselves first. And that's important. That's so get it yourself and then share it with others. And that's, that's basically the core message of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really is. So, you know, get that light yourself and then share it with others. And it's okay to ask questions. Absolutely. There ain't no, there ain't no person alive that ain't going to have a question. So I love, I love personally, I, you know, I've had some sort of a faith crisis to say to per se myself. And it was especially built around the race issue, uh, you know, with the, the race and the priesthood and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was built more around that. And I, it, it took me a little while. But when you start learning the history of it, you start going, wait a minute. And then you, you can come and get the resolve. After you, you can make the resolve that you need after you learn. And then you kind of go, well, Heavenly Father, what's going on with this now? And you ask that question. You've got to ask him, you know, what is going on with this? this stuff why did, why was it like this why is it and it's important that we involve the lord in all of this in our in our prayers and, you know i just i just for me i like i said i've had a very powerful experience with the book of mormon i just can't even it's hard to ignore it it's hard to you know, it would be hard for me to like ignore that experience that i've had with the book of mormon on on a repeated basis it's not just a one time deal over my lifetime it's been a repeated thing that the spirit continues to confirm to me that the book is a divine book it was a divine there was divine power that came in the organization of it and the bringing forth of it in our day it's just really in my mind very very easy to believe in it so very easy. So, but and that may not be the case for all, all people. I mean, so they'll need stronger examination, I guess. They'll have to examine it very closely. And uh, I hope they would. I would invite all who are perhaps listening to this. Just the Book of Mormon is the key. The Book of Mormon makes that connection. It's just an, it's an amazing book, and I think people will see as time goes by. If you engage that book, it will it will change change your whole outlook on everything. So, even all your doubts. One of my favorite questions to ask is if you have had any tender mercies that are not too sacred or private to share to to share with us that indicated to you specifically that Heavenly Father was absolutely aware of you as as an individual? Well, I do have several that are too sacred to, to share, but I do have one that I might I might share. My um, my father and I are were semi professional musicians. And uh, music is a very important aspect of our lives. Uh, it goes back, gener it's generational um, on both sides of my, my family, mom and dad. And playing music and learning music and understanding it and being able to have some talent in it, is, it's actually blessed our lives. And so dad and I, were, we, act, we used to actually perform semi-professionally. Dad was a guitar player, I'm a bass player. And um, they, my dad got pretty sick at the end. And then his life, he's not, he's passed now. And that was about seven or eight years ago. 
and uh, he got really, really sick. And then uh, doctors came to me and basically told me that he he may not last another 24 to 48 hours with this, with how sick he's, he got. And so I was like, you know, you're, you're almost in disbelief, you know what I mean? Because, you know, your parents are usually those, you know, they're real strong, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, you know, you never, you don't think your kid, your mom and dad are ever going to die, you know, but uh, I, re I remember dad, uh, he was really, really at peace about it. He, at least he seemed it. He didn't talk about it much. And uh, he wasn't in good shape. And so I just, I decided to clean him up. And uh, He had, you know, he had soiled himself. And so he wasn't getting the nursing attention that he needed really. And I saw he was pretty, pretty dirty. So I, I helped clean him up and put new fresh clean linen on him before he, before he went to the other side. And one of the things I did was I, I had to end up, end up having to wash his feet. It was, uh, yeah, his feet were pretty soiled. It wasn't a pleasant experience, frankly. <laughs> so I, I finished cleaning him up with put fresh socks on him. And uh, he wasn't, he didn't really want clothes on because he was, he was basically dying of heat. It was the middle of August and the air conditioning was only about just getting it to barely comfortable in the hospital there. And so I I had that moment to to do that service for him. And uh, I don't know how to say, but I was able to I was able to accept that Emily, Emily Father's answer was no, that he needed him over on the other side. And it was, it was, uh, you know, it was a peaceful experience. And so when he did go, though we were very shocked and, you know, because he, he, went, he went a little sudden, that, you know, he just got sick and then died. It only took him about a month. So, and uh, but in the meantime, I I found that oh, if I hadn't if that had never he had never left, I've uh, taken to the guitar. I've always been a bass player, and you know, bass and a guitar are quite a bit different. And now I feel him. He visits me regularly, and I can tell. He comes in, he, he helps me with different things that I'm learning from the guitar. And I know that's hard for people to, maybe an unbeliever might not, they'll appreciate what I'm talking about. But I think there's a lot of believers that will say, yeah, you know, I'm kind of in touch with what's going on on the other side of the spiritual realm. And uh, so I, he visits me regularly now and it, uh, it helps me cope. It helps me to bring honor to him. And and I'm learning the guitar like you can't believe anymore. I'm just really starting to, the guitar is really opening up to me now. And I'm, it's an interesting little uh, chain of events that have kind of happened with me. I, if, I, if, he was, if he wasn't gone, I would have just been a bass player. But now I can add more to my talent. And that is to be able to play guitar and and to be proficient at it and to be decent at it. And right now I would call myself an intermediate player. But you know, I'm I'm creeping up on that on the more skilled skilled 
skills of the guitar. So it really helps me and I'm enjoying the journey. It really is helping me to enjoy, you know, learning music and learning things uh, that, that, that he left for me as a part of the heritage that we belong to. So, and there's more to heritage than just, you know, than what you see on the outside sometimes. It's, there's little little things like this, like like music and other things that people don't even realize that they they have received from from their ancestors before them. And so it's been a really you know it's been an exciting journey for me to discover the world of the guitar and to to get good. And I, you know, anybody knows my dad, and anybody knows Hugh Jones, my dad. And if you knew him, you know he was a really accomplished guitarist and singer. And uh, he was quite good at what he did. He's really good at his craft. And so I'm, I'd like to think that I get some of that from him. As you described that, that scene, too, I was thinking about how our Savior um, washed the feet of his disciples. And I was seeing um, you being able to to have that small role of the savior for your father for just a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story and, and uh, how he continues to affect your life right now. Yeah, he does. He visits, he visits regularly. I can, most, most of the time I can feel when he, when he walks in the room. So, my, patri my patriarchal blessing assures me that I will know that the work for the dead is a real thing. And I count that these experiences that I'm having in this way are that it's just that it's a, it gives me the assurance that the work for the dead and the work that is happening on the other side in the spiritual realm is a real thing. It's not just something we that Joseph Smith made up. It really isn't. And the hearts of the fathers are turning to the children and the children to their fathers. And it's really, if you want to get involved in it, it's, it's a really fun journey. So I recommend it to anybody who wants to follow Jesus Christ. Thank you. I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Uh, well, I used to, like I told you before, I, it, I used to believe that it was just from my native side. But it was, but I have discovered in more recent times that it comes from both sides. It comes from the Gentile side as well. And if anybody knows anything about it, you can, there's, there's a lot of research that links the Gentiles to the Middle East. <laughs> it's really, really just uncanny how um, Joseph Smith and hit all the people of the early church were from the British Isles and the Scandinavian countries. And that those were the very places that the exiled people after Jerusalem had fallen and the temple had been destroyed. That the people went north and they went up into the British Isles. And so the people, the Lord was preparing those people and they would become, you know, the fathers of and have children and down generation, generational, they would become eventually the people like Joseph Smith and those people that would come, the Puritans that would come to America and uh, settle the land of America. So this is really. Paul, this whole thing is just such a divine, divinely guided thing from God. This, to me, that's what this church is. This church is is divinely guided by by the, the God, the God of Israel. Has just been just been giving this. He knows where everything is going on, and we think we know history. And I think we're going to find out someday, Andrea, that we know nothing about history here on this earth. When we get to the other side, we're going to be able to ask those questions of the people who lived it. The people who lived those histories. 
we'll be able to ask those opinions. I think it's going to change our minds in a lot of ways for every one of us, all of us. It's going to change our minds because we're going to be able to actually ask the people that it really happened to. And so, um, um, you know, we like to think that we know a lot about history, but I, I think we do know generalities, but I don't think we know a lot of the details. And one day we're going to all we're going to all gather together and we're going to share some of the histories that each of us experienced. And we're going to have that, those experiences with each other. And it's going to be, a, it's going to be fun. I, I'm looking forward to the day when we can open that discussion up, have the educational experiences that will just totally change our mind. And we will be able to see just exactly how God has just directed this detail after detail after detail. He just directed this whole this whole thing of restoring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the earth. And I just, I just, that's, that's my, that's my take on it. We're going to just not be able to deny it someday. It's just going to be really evident to all of us. And so that's, that's part of that. That's Israel to me, Israel. We, and we need to honor that heritage. That heritage is important. It's an important heritage because it's part of the Abrahamic covenant. What it what it means is that it's not because we're the we're the favorite, like we're the favorite lineage, is that we have been given the commission to take the gospel to the entire world. That's what that means. And that's a huge responsibility given to each of us. And so if this if that's what this interview from you to me can can do and help share that gospel to to more people that can hear about this, then so be it. I, I, I'm totally welcome. That's why I really, you know, welcoming to your invitation to have this interview. And so I really, I hope people can hear the sincerity and the, the conviction that I have of the restored gospel and how it, how it has changed not only my life, but will change anybody's life who will adopt it and bring it into their life. And so, I hope that helps or hope that uh, answers your question. I hope it answers you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have really appreciated all the things you've shared and um, I've felt the Holy Ghost. So thank you for bringing that. Today I wanted to share a little bit about my calling. I, I think I've told you before, but I'm in the Young Women. I'm not a counselor. I'm not the president. Um, I'm the secretary. So I get to pick and choose a little bit more what I am involved in. I'm spare hands sometimes, and sometimes I'm a little bit more than that. But um, the past... Two weekends, our young women did a Book of Mormon readathon, and our young women president put so much effort into it. I, hearing her talk about how she gauged the time and set up schedules and everything that she did, I am so impressed with her. But I'm impressed that the young women were able to do to accomplish it. They read the Book of Mormon on two Fridays and two Saturdays. So just four days they read the Book of Mormon. Um, I don't know that they read every word for word, but they read a vast majority of it. They watched some of the church videos. There were some guests who came in and... Uh, performed it, performed skits of parts of the scriptures. Um, some of it they listened to, some of it they read out, most of it they read out loud to each other. Uh, some of it they listened to on audio, like uh, online audio, and they did it at 1.5 speed so they could catch up a little bit. And they also played and got to know each other. I'm really grateful for our young women president and for her testimony that she wanted to share 
with the young women that she so diligently prepared for them to receive and made it possible for them to have that experience. And I'm so grateful for the young women who took the time to attend as much of the four days as they could and truly feel the spirit, whether or not they particularly had a a, uh, experience with the Book of Mormon, they were able to have an experience with the Holy Ghost. And I actually finished reading the Book of Mormon yesterday as well, the same day that they finished their Book of Mormon readathon. And the verse that stood out to me was Moroni 10 verse 5, where it tells us that the Holy Ghost will testify And I am thankful for the Holy Ghost. I am thankful for that sweet spirit, for warmth and comfort and knowledge that have been given to me because of the Holy Ghost at at different times in my life. And I just wanted to share that with you and I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. If you know someone who might be interested in being a guest, please reach out to me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.